So, we're back into uh, section three uh, at the table, and we're now going to talk about this subject matter of ethics. And it's a, it's a topic that uh, lawyers always uh, don't give enough consideration to, um, I think because we get so much of it uh, through our training and everything else. Um, and uh, people are more interested maybe in getting the tips and that sort of thing out of these programs. But I, I, think, it, I think you shouldn't do that when it comes to uh, the, the, the subject matter of competitive bargaining. It's a special circumstance. I really feel that. Uh, and, it's, and it's due to the fact that the, the nature of the beast uh, basically is founded on deception when you come right down to it. Let's face it. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to hide our um, resistance point. We're trying to make people think. Uh, that it's somewhere where it's not, um, and uh, you know it's basically a, a concept of deception. And every time, every time when you get a deal, to a certain extent, you deceive somebody into thinking you know that your resistance point is somewhere where it isn't, because if they knew your resistance point, that's where it would end up. And that's that's the that's the problem. Um, it's the kind of uh, built-in uh, built-in uh, conundrum to the whole to the whole thing. It's the it's the challenge of fair deception, is how I've titled it. And, and it applies it applies in bargaining. The quote I have from Lewicki uh, is, is really, it says bargaining, but it refers to uh, ne negotiation, I mean, it refers to negotiation, and so it, it's, it's, the problem's there everywhere, but even more so uh, in, in bargaining because gamesmanship is so much more part of the game. And uh, it's particularly difficult for, uh, for lawyers uh, because we're retained to act, uh, act uh, you know, vigorously, represent our, represent our clients, to, our, to, their interest and, and to obtain as much as we can, so it's very adversarial, and, and that's where that's what we're retained to do. So it becomes uh, even even more problematic for us, and and that's why it's described as the you know, ethical no man's land for for legal practice for all these reasons. And um, there are, there are no kind of bright lines. We sort of have instances on on each end. We you know, we know clearly unethical behavior we know that other other areas making offers for instance generally is, is not but between there there's there's a lot of agree stuff and so what we're going to try and talk very briefly here is we're going to try to talk a little bit about those problems and certainly lay out to you um, some of the different approaches that are there in professional uh, regulation because we lawyers do have imposed upon us special rules and uh, to make sure everybody understands how the rules work and also understand that they're really not a liability uh, to somebody who's uh, an experienced uh, negotiator or bargainer. So uh, I don't. Uh, the, uh, the a lot of this is taken from uh, a, a book by uh, Richard Shell. I'm going to I'm going to mention some of these references at the end of the course. Uh, but he's a well-known guru in the field, and and his view is that ethics uh, are the are the starting point and not the ending point when it comes to bargaining. And I agree with that completely. But anyway, there's the, the concept that there's three schools of ethical bargaining. This is, and this has been really reflected in a debate. There's an ongoing debate in the United States, and, and it's a quite an interesting debate. And in fact, it's come into Canada because you're going to see we have uh, kind of high integrity rules which have been adopted in Alberta, as opposed to Ontario, which has some some rules, but I don't think they're completely understood, particularly around around uh, mediators. But there's the, there's the three schools. Uh, there's the gamesmanship, which anything goes. It's not illegal or contrary to the professional rules. There's the high integrity, which minimizes deception to the extent that you can, given the nature of the beast, um, and uh, which we really see reflected in the Alberta rules. Um, and then there's this pragmatic, pragmatic school, which is basically uh, um, you, you put your credibility, you put your reputation ahead of things, and you don't do anything that would impact on that because the long term result is is actually better than the short-term gain and so therefore you do it when you have to uh, but not not necessarily so that's uh, and I think probably uh, as where most people are uh, that aren't guided by uh, the, the high integrity rules so um, as we go forward uh, we're going to see that there's it's come out in, in professional standards the American American states um, are pretty much laissez-faire. They have nothing that really speaks to uh, lawyers as negotiators, uh, and basically they want and they're trying to stop fraud and, and, and intentional misrepresentations. Alberta is uh, stands out in all of North America. They've adopted provisions right in their professional rules for lawyers as negotiators, and they've imposed uh, very high standards. And as I said, there's Ontario, which has uh, kind of got some implied rules and and uh, rules that apply in mediations. 
So why don't we just look uh, at the Alberta Code. Um, it basically sort of has a rule, lawyer as negotiator says, hey, you know, the fact you're negotiating doesn't change principles that you're a lawyer and you've got to adhere to these rules. And, um, and I've just picked out a couple of things, but the main thing is that they say a lawyer must not lie to or mislead. And I think it's the mislead, which is really the, uh, um, the, the, the kind of the, the broad, broad scope, uh, the broad brush, because when you look at misleading, it includes any, you know, creating misconception through oral or written statements, other communications, actions, conduct, uh, failure to act, or silence. So it's got the whole gamut. And, and when you think about it, I, I mean, if, if you were to apply it, completely, um, it, it would pick up no bluffing of any kind. Basically, I guess, trying to drive out competitive bargaining and getting us into more into negotiation. But, but I'm sorry to say, even in negotiation, you're going to have uh, misleading, you're going to have some misconception. Uh, and, and I guess the question is, you know, it's, uh, I mean, when you, when you do an offer, to a certain extent, you could say, well, I'm creating a misconception of where my where my bottom line is. So clearly there's a lot of interpretation that goes into that rules, but the idea is it's high integrity uh, system or regime, that's what they want. They want their lawyers to be, uh, to, be uh, and have to have those rules uh, applying to them. And, and, and I guess the thing is, well, people are going to, lawyers are going to say, well, what happens when I go to head to head with a lawyer from Ontario or the United States that doesn't have these rules? Well, what happens, uh, how am I going to, uh, what's my client going to say when, when, I'm, uh, when I'm acting uh, for them as, as, as their representative? And somebody out, uh, out, out in the field who's not a lawyer, and let's face it, uh, I'd say probably the majority of a negotiation is done by non-lawyers, uh, even though lawyers, it's very much part of our business. But uh, so how can we compete with them when, you know, uh, we say to them, no, I'm sorry, we can't make misrepresentations about our authority or final offer or things like that. So, and um, people out on the street don't have those worries. So it's something that, that it appears to put us at a disadvantage, uh, lawyers at a disadvantage, and it's, and it's one of the issues that's there. And, and in the United States, I think it's one of the reasons that they've sort of said anything that's, uh, as long as it's not illegal, goes, more or less. Uh, and, um, and, and so that's kind of the problem that's, that's there in imposing these very stringent rules on, on, uh, on, on lawyers. In any event, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Ontario has no specific provision uh, dealing with, uh, w with lawyers as negotiators. Uh, there are some uh, general statements in there, you have to maintain the integrity of the profession, acting in good faith and fair dealing, which could lend themselves, I think, to interpretations. Uh, certainly there's a concept there that we shouldn't uh, be making material lies uh, in any event, and, and I think material lies in any event are, 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 are illegal, let's face it. Um, but what, the one thing that's interesting in Ontario is they do have provisions uh, which are uh, pick, pick up, uh, I think, give broader, broader protection uh, against uh, inappropriate behaviour by, uh, by attaching them to mediators and mediators, uh, when we're acting as mediators, being, become part of, of a tribunal. So basically the same rules that apply when you're before a judge, working with a judge, apply to a mediator or anybody who's involved, and mediators defined very broadly, I haven't tried to put it all in here, but it's defined very broadly. And so it picks up, uh, you know, picks up that situation. So basically we're a tribunal, when you're working with us, lawyers are working with, with a mediator, you're an advocate and all the rules of advocacy apply. And uh, basically, you know, um, so that um, when it comes to that, you, you mustn't mislead the tribunal about the position. Uh, of, of the client, uh, etc. You mustn't know, knowingly assist or permit the client to, to get away with these things, and we understand that well. You mustn't knowingly misstate the contents of document, testimony of a witness, uh, the substance of an argument, or the, uh, or the provisions of a statute like authority. Uh, obviously that's aimed more at an advocate before a judge making submissions, but it's broad enough, I think, to pick up uh, what we do and knowingly assert as a true and a fact when its truth cannot reasonably be supported by the evidence. So I would certainly take uh, the position that when you're involved with a third party neutral who's helping out in, in the negotiations in any form or fashion, uh, you have rules that you cannot uh, be engaged in lying, you cannot uh, tell, um, you, know, you cannot basically make things up and so it would pick up things like uh, lying about your final authority, um, lying about um, uh, fi about all, all final offers and a, a lot of things that uh, you know that are that, that generally we're going to look at in terms of, uh, of lying when we look at lying as a hardball issue uh, in, in, the, in the coming section. So I think that um, that's something that all lawyers, I don't think most lawyers in Ontario have ever seen it actually to tell you the truth. 
Um, and uh, I just didn't know about it until I really got into the ethics, uh, studying ethics myself, and I haven't seen it mentioned in any text anywhere, so um, a new perspective. Um, the, um, I, I guess what I want to get across here, though, is, is my view that I very strongly feel uh, that kind of on, Alberta's on the right track here. Uh, to be a high integrity bargainer doesn't really mean you have to give up anything except kind of the home runs against the inexperienced bargainers. And you know, if that's what you want, uh, hey, that's great, but you got to look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. And, and I don't think you got a lot of gains there, really. But against experienced bargainers, all of this gamesmanship, it's not going to do a thing. Um, basically, it's going to come down in the end to the experience, the intuition you bring to it, your knowledge of, of how you do things and, 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 and the processes that we're teaching here today. And there's a lot of things you can do to influence which are completely uh, completely above board and you're allowed to frame any way you want and to talk and, and, and to, uh, to talk about best possible uh, best possible outcomes and, and, and put things forward in a vivid fashion, all these things that we're going to look at in, in influencing. So, um, I'm just saying that uh, I'm not sure you're really re really giving up too much by being a high integrity bargainer. And certainly what you're ending up with is, is you're certainly supporting your own self-respect, which is really important for a long successful career as lawyers, let's face it. Good reputations, and you do get uh, effective outcomes. Uh, and over, over the long run, you'll be seen as uh, somebody who's a better bargainer, because that's what really comes out of all that. You have more business. So, uh, I, I think that uh, when, we, when we're looking at this, and I think we're going to have a debate of some sort coming up in Ontario as to should we have a rule uh, specifically for bargainers. They've, they've done it in Alberta. Alberta's led the way. Strange province to have it leading the way when you think about it. Sort of where a land where everything uh, is, uh, seems to get uh, undone, but uh, actually that moved by itself. So, so those are my comments on, on ethics. Uh, they're brief, but uh, hopefully they're helpful. So we're now into section five, and um, I think maybe I'll just talk a little bit about hardball tactics uh, before I move on to the next video, because I, I'm trying always to put a, a limit my time I put on any video. Um, hardball tactics, uh, their extreme influencing, influencing tactics is what they are. And some of these, you know, uh, they're not illegal, but I, I just think that they're, they're at the far edge, or, or at least you should understand what's going on in terms of influencing because there's no question there's deception and they would just about always would infringe the uh, the Alberta rules, that's for sure. Uh, a lot of them wouldn't um, in uh, the Ontario rules. But basically there's two approaches to hardball. Uh, one is, is, you, is you manipulate the information, which is what we see most often. It's you know, basically lying um, and uh, or you know, exaggerating one interest versus another, etc. along those lines. Um, and so that's kind of the common one. But the other one is, is by pressuring how the decision-making process should be made. And I'm not talking about putting time conditions on, you know, getting, make up your mind and what, by the end of the session. And what, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the extreme ones using basically intimidation, um, uh, uh, yeah, discrim discrimination, extreme criticism, a diminishment and things like that, which really throw people off, get their minds off the game, and, 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 and basically mess up their decision-making processes. So those are the kind of the, the, the two ways uh, that, uh, that it's done. Uh, so uh, the topics we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at lying, we're going to look at authority and screening tactics, which probably aren't really, uh, don't even infringe uh, most of the, the high um, integrity rules, but, but I just think authority, the concept of not having, uh, not having the person, the decision maker there and things like that, is something that you should really see and understand the disadvantage of. Lots of offer tactics, the low balling and, and things like that, add-ons, etc. Surface bargaining, which is basically where step in the process. You see it a lot in the industrial relations area, but, uh, but the idea is we're really not here today to, to get a deal done. Intimidation criticism, well here we're, we're starting to work on the decision making processes, diminishing tactics, uh, working on the, um, the, 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 the decision making process, and false trust and status. I guess I don't know where that fits, but uh, basically uh, trying to say people, you know, you can rely on me, I'm a good guy, uh, when you're really not. So I think we'll stop there and uh, we'll continue on uh, the hardball tactics in the next video.